Uh, we're in a, an advanced extended series. Uh, we'll break for Easter, Palm Sunday, but we probably will continue with because it's going much more slowly than I anticipated. It's called what the title slide should be up there, Advancing the Kingdom, Resisting the Enemy. And we focused on advancing the kingdom. Now we're focusing on resisting the enemy, doing it sequentially, but uh, not trying to take verse by verse through the book of Acts. The second slide gives a bit of the focus, foolishness and uh, the disdain of others. We'll do the first part, foolishness. I didn't know the song set this morning. Sometimes the worship team sends out songs. Sometimes they don't. I didn't look at my computer this morning, at least my email, so they may have sent one out. I had no idea, and that song Shane did about, that Shane did, that we danced to, I've never heard that song before, uh, but they couldn't have picked a better song, and you couldn't have responded better for what the topic is, uh, foolishness. Now, I think the first three things that are found in the book of Acts as the church began to advance are the three big ones that you will have to deal with, I will have to deal with in our lives if we're going to fully embrace the kingdom and walk in it and be abandoned to it. Yes, we will get to where the religious establishment becomes very opposed. We will get to where the government becomes very opposed. We will get to contentions and warring and fighting in the church. But I think the first three things that are found in the book of Acts that they had to deal with, we have to deal with on a regular basis, I have found in my own life they are really significant things to advance the kingdom. Do they come out of the enemy? Well, they come out of pride, I'm convinced. And I believe pride was introduced through Satan's allurement and his uh, betrayal and his deception. So in that sense, they certainly come from the enemy. But it finds a residency within us, within all of us. I certainly find it in me. Uh, I remember the time that I said to the Lord, I would like to repent of pride, but I can't find it. I can't see it. If I could really see it, I would. And I remember he spoke to me. The reason I interpreted this God speaking to me, uh, the thoughts that formed in my mind, it was, it actually begins under your feet and it goes up above your eyebrows. So you're like a container and that's how full the container is. And in reality, everything you do is flavored with pride, but you can't tell it because everything is flavored with pride. I think it's true. So as we move on to the Sunday morning, March the 8th, the book of Acts, number in the uh, seventh in the series, seeming foolishness, that's what we'll focus on. I won't do the second, mocking, minimized, and marginalized. Uh, hopefully next week we will take that part. Seemingly foolishness, moving forward. Seeming foolish. This is foolish. So just... Going through the book of Acts, we find ourselves in chapter 2. I heard Mike Bickle make a statement many, many years ago as he was referring to Acts chapter 2 and made this statement the first time that I heard it. It was, God will offend the mind to reveal the heart. There are things that God does deliberately that our minds, especially the educated, I have a PhD in electron microscopy, I've post doc two years in colon cancer research, I've spent a lot of time in school, I have a lot of education, I have multiple degrees, and discovered that is very much a hindrance. It hinders. Because we try to, it's got to be logical, it's got to make sense. Is that what an educated person would do? Why did God choose that for my background, for my path? I don't know. But I've embraced it. I'm thankful for it. I've experienced this a lot. God will offend the mind to reveal the heart. Where do you find that? The next slide, Acts chapter 2, verse 4. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Let me just try and paint the background. Is they had been with the Lord, the disciples. And so for three, three and a half years of ministry, they followed him, they walked with him. I'm sure at some point in time, they had it in their thinking, at least I would have, this is the way it ought to be done. Large crowds, people get hungry, you just feed them. You start off with five loaves, a few fishes, and you can feed 5,000 Plus, that's just the men, plus the women and children. 
and you run into a funeral procession and there's this young boy, you just he'll raise him from the dead and you move on. I mean, it's a great way to do crowds. Blind lepers, lepers, the uh, plague of that time period, isolated, unclean, you just heal them. It was like, Jesus, this is the answer. You're the answer. How you're approaching things, power, this is power evangelism to the max. I, I would have thought that way. I would have thought, why would we want anything different than you? Please stay, lead it, lead the movement. We've got it made. But in the course of the three and a half years, Jesus said multiple times, I'm going to leave. It is actually better for you that I leave because I'm going to send the comforter to you. He is going to help you. It's actually to your benefit. He's going to show you all things. He's going to remind you of the things that I've said. It's best for you that I go away so that the helper comes. He will help you. I can imagine my thoughts would have been, how can there be any better help than what we've experienced the last three and a half years? As I said, power evangelism to the max. So the day of Pentecost, and you know, we were ready for the kingdom to come, and Jesus said, acting like I'm one of the disciples on the day he ascended, you know, is today the day? Are you gonna, is it going to happen right now? The kingdom, the glory, the restored to Israel. And I mean, we're going to do this thing all over the world. He, and Jesus said, that time is in the Father's hands. In essence, that's his business. It's set, and it will come to pass for the time period that he has set. But what you're to do is go and wait for what I've promised you, the helper. Oh, yeah, it's better for me. This is better for me than going to meetings where the lepers are healed, the blind, are, are uh, they're able to see, the cripples who have been crippled for their whole lifetime, bent back people, their backs are healed. This is going to be better. What's going to take place is going to be better. And how could it be better than those kinds of meetings? And Jesus said, go and wait. So they go and wait. And they do it with all their being. And they work at being together and being in relationship. And the day arrives when the helper arrives and God was offending the minds then and now through all the years. The presenting form of the helper was, yes, it was the sound of a mighty rushing wind, Yes, it was tongues of fire, and it was tongues. This was the helper. This was his arrival. I don't know if there's some provision of God that is more marginalized, more put down, more in the Western world. I'm not going to say what I don't know what I'm saying, because if I don't know what I'm saying, I'm not going to say it. So I'm not going to let something come out of my mouth that I don't know what I'm saying. I don't know how you could have more control. Here it is. The helper comes. It's the helper. It's what Jesus said. This is actually better for you than me staying here. This is better. And the tension of this is foolish. That's it. The tension begins. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. I want to read to you next slide, 1 Corinthians 1.18. For the message of the cross is foolishness. God uses things that seem foolish to the educated mind, to the mind that I got it all worked out, I've got to have it all figured out, that seem foolish and reveals the heart. Really, what we're saying when we say, oh, that's foolish, what we're really saying, what I've discovered about my own heart, that's beyond me. I'm beyond that. I don't need that. that that's beyond me. That's what I'm saying. Well, that's pride. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. But it's packaged in a message that those who 
are rejecting it. It's just, that is foolish. What good could that be? It's an incredible weapon that is used against us. Against you, against me, against all of us. Reading again in 1 Corinthians, For since in the wisdom of God, the world through, the wisdom, through its wisdom did not know God. It pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached. So it was the proclamation of what Jesus did. That and embracing and accepting the proclamation. Because we're not there, we're not watching it. It's accepting the proclamation of that. Well, if you're going to be saved, and I mean, you've got to work. It's got to be based. There's something we have to do. No, you listen and you accept, you embrace, you accept. Through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. Again, in 1 Corinthians 1.25, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. There's so much that God does that the human mind, the prideful human, is that's foolishness. And the day of Pentecost is certainly, I don't know what is more resisted. Passed away, that was only for them. They needed it, we don't need it. Right, we don't need it. Just listen to the news. Just do it once a year. You know, don't, don't be oppressed by you know, gorging yourself on the news and because uh, it's not good and it's, it's one murder after another, one mass murder. It's just awful and we don't need it because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Again, 1 Corinthians 2.14, but the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God for their what? Their foolishness to him. God will offend the mind to reveal the heart. It's pride. I remember when uh, it was the time for me to receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit. It wasn't a part of my past. wasn't part of my culture. wasn't part of the church culture that I'd been in. And we started hanging around a church in Knoxville that uh, the pastor had received the baptism in the Holy Spirit, and they had home groups. And in those home groups... That's where most of the people who received were receiving at that point in time. And the process was they'd put a chair in the, um, they'd take a chair and they'd put a chair in the room. And I don't know, there'd be 15 or 20 people present. And all this is brand new to me. And I'm very curious and discerning and questioning and all of those things that we are very prone, I was very prone to do. And they would sit in the chair and they would pray for them and it'd go on 30, 35, sometimes 45 minutes. They'd pray on their shoulders, pray on their heads. They'd kneel down beside them. They'd put their hands on their knees if it was appropriate. They would pray. And I, after a while, after several nights of watching this, you know, a week would go by, I'd watch it again and again. I sat there and I made the decision, I'm not going to sit in the chair, A, because <laughs> nothing happens and I'm just, I'm just not going to do it. So the day comes that the pastor, his mother-in-law, lived right across from us on the hill where we live, and the washing machine, the mother-in-law's washing machine, went bad, and they had a child that had diapers. This was back years ago when dinosaurs existed, and you had cloth diapers that you actually washed out and, you know, reused. I know, I'm that old. And uh, so he had a load of diapers to do, and their washing machine was broken, so Faye and I, we had one. So he called. It was just a, you know, 50-yard walk. Could I come and wash the diapers? Why, sure. So it was a grand, glorious meeting. Faye and I and Frank sitting in our living room waiting for the washing machine to wash these diapers. And I'm sitting there, and, you know, and he's talking, and uh, Faye had already received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and she had one of those experiences that people write books about, and, you know, She'd had several weeks, and she'd had incredible deliverance, and you know, we didn't believe in that, and, uh, but she still had it. We didn't believe in it, but she had it, uh, and I just, wow, and I just wasn't in the place that she was. I was in graduate school starting my Ph.D. program. I loved it. I loved where I was, what I was doing. I couldn't 
uh, my wife was very unhappy because we couldn't have any children. I didn't share the sorrow that she had. She was ready to commit suicide over it. I was not there. Um, and so we hung around these people that, that knew the baptism, the Holy Spirit. All of this was unnecessary. Everybody important in my past who I knew uh, that of, the, of the groups I'd been raised, they didn't have it. So it can't be right. And that's, they're out of control. You know, they're just, they're out of control. So that's, the thought comes to me, just get a chair. I'm sitting in my living room in my house on Tolson Lane. And the thought comes to me, just go into the kitchen, our little kitchen, get a chair, put it down in the middle of the room, sit in it. And I'm thinking, I'm not going to get a chair. I'm not going to do that. I, I, I'm just not. So this journey didn't begin in some grand, wonderful, glorious meeting that was just totally out of control. It was my living room and the diapers, poopy diapers. They were being washed in, in my washing machine. And I hear this thought. It, it just seems like this th sentence formed in my mind. Just go into your kitchen, get a chair, pick it up, put it down in the living room, sit in it. Because that was sort of the posture that I, over the past weeks, that's what I'd seen. So that's what people do. They sit in the chair. Nothing ever happened to someone sitting in the chair, but that's what you do. You sit in the chair. So, uh, so Frank and Faye are having this nice conversation, and I'm going through this battle in my mind, this huge foolishness battle. It's incredible, and it keeps many of us from saying yes to the Lord because it seems foolish. It's foolish. Is dancing the answer? No, dancing's not the answer, though it's incredibly biblical. But there are many times that when you say, uh, I want something that I can't control, what are the two words of that last song we sang? That I um, set a fire down in my heart that I can't contain and I can't control. There's wonderful words. And sometimes you, and I think more than not give yourself to things where the intent of it is to worship, to honor God. Because it helps you. It helps you make decisions. But what is a significant decision? To me, my will, Acts chapter 1 versus his will, what I want you to do right now is go to Jerusalem. The second one is foolish. This is foolish. This is the helper this is better, according to Jesus, this is better for me than to walk side by side with Jesus, meaning in the natural, following him as his disciple. This is better. So I did it after I don't know how many minutes. It seemed like forever. Again and again, just go in the kitchen, pick up a chair, sit it in the living room, and sit, uh, my living room, my house, and just sit in it. So I did. I stood up, I went into the... I didn't say anything. They had no idea what was going on in my mind. Usually that's occurring. You're dealing with the foolishness battle and you keep it all quiet. I was. And I picked up the chair, went in, put it down and, and sat in it. And I was just staring at Frank like he was sitting there. I just sat it and I just sat I just sat it. I didn't say anything. Of course, the chair had great meaning in those days. So he said, oh, you want to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I mean, they knew what the chair meant. The chair. That's what people remember out this message. The chair. I said, yes. I had no idea what God had for me. My treasure chest of experiences that God has permitted me to have in life, I had no idea what he had for me. I didn't. The first charismatic meeting I went to, it was in a building, and I sat by the door. I told Faye, I'm going to sit by the door. If anything out of the ordinary takes place, I'm gone. I did. I sat right by the door. They handed the cards out like we had cards. I forgot to have them handed out. Uh, they handed out cards. I took the card. I kept it in my lap. Faye was sitting next to me. She saw it, and uh, she, uh, the guy, when they came to receive the offering, uh, asked if I had filled one in. I looked at him, looked him right in the eyes, and I said, I already did. And Faye elbowed me. She said, you did not. And I told them, I, I told Faye, I'm not going to let them have my name. I have no idea who they are and what they are. And 
I was so afraid. <clears throat> Foolishness. What is it you have to deal with? You have to deal with your will. And then when God starts revealing His will and His idea of this is right, you have to then deal with the pride of it's not the way I would do it. This is foolish. This doesn't make any sense. So he prayed for me, and seemingly nothing happened. I felt nothing. I didn't even have as much as a twitch of an eyelash. Nothing happened. Just sat there. He said, well, are you ready to speak in tongues? I said, yes. And I had read enough to know when you receive the baptism, you can speak in tongues. You may or may not, but that'll be up to you. Well, I know sometimes there's a cult bondage and so on, but if you've received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you can pray in tongues. You can do it. Few, with very, very few exceptions, that you, a prayer of deliverance will set you free from that. So uh, I just knew, and I knew that the Holy Spirit wasn't going to speak in tongues. He would give me the utterance, the words, the vocabulary, but he wasn't going to speak in tongues. I knew it's not a voice inside of me of some kind of being. You need help. We'll be glad to help pray for you. You need that cast out. Uh, and So I just knew I've got to yield my voice. I knew it's a language, so... I don't know what to do. So I said, just pray for me. And uh, he laid his hands on me, and I opened my mouth, and I just said, ka, ka. And I stopped him, and I said, Frank, I'm saying that. And he had the wisdom to say, you're just yielding your voice to God. I said, I can do that. Also, inside of me, I said, if I don't pray in tongues, it's not going to be my fault. Uh, I, wasn't, I wasn't challenging God. I wasn't trying to tell him I was just saying, it's not going to be my fault. So I said, let's do it again. So he I'm sitting in the chair, the chair that nothing happens in. in. In my own living room, I'm sitting in the chair. in my own, And he lays his hands on me again. And he starts to pray in tongues. And I just, I don't know what to do. So I just said, ka, ka, ka. And he, I stop him a second time. And I said, Frank, I am saying that. I'm, that's a word, ka. It's, it's not English. I'm just, I'm, he said, I know. He had the wisdom to say at that time, you're just yielding your voice to God. That's a good thing to do. And again, I said inwardly, I'm sure it was laced with pride. If I don't speak in tongues, it is not going to be my fault. I said, let's do it again. So we did it the third time. He laid his hands on me the third time. And the only testimony that's worth anything uh, that has lasting benefit is I saw uh, what amounted to a blackboard, whiteboard. I saw a whiteboard, blackboard, and I saw written on it a paragraph in another language. I've only seen it one time in my life. This was in the 70s, one time. And I read the paragraph. How did you know how to read it? I don't know. I read the paragraph. What did the paragraph say? I don't know. I read the paragraph, and I had an instant, fluent language in tongues that I've had ever since. I had to deal with the foolishness barrier. It's foolish. I don't understand it. You want me to do what? Now what is that going to accomplish? How is that going to get me from here to... I think you've told me that I'm eventually going to be doing this, but... Tongues are going to help me get from here to there? Uh, 1 Corinthians 3.19 For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God, for it is written, He catches the wise in their own craftiness. Matthew 3.4 Now John himself, here's an interesting one. Now John himself, so here's the forerunner. Is this how you would do it? Here's the forerunner. And he is, you know, all of history has been waiting for the forerunner, the coming of the Messiah, the Christ. So here's the guy who's uh, going to be the forerunner for the coming of Christ, to prepare, to prepare a highway for God. Very interesting character. Would you have done it this way? Now, John himself was clothed in camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locust and wild honey. Is that what you would have done? His office was the desert. That's where he was. And he was, he was dealing with everybody. 
Is that what you would have picked? So here's another one, 2 Kings 5, 12. So here's this uh, king of this enemy, and he's got leprosy. And he comes to the prophet in Israel, and the prophet says, go down to our dirty, nasty river, and I want you to bathe in it seven times, and you'll come up whole. Now, come on. God will offend your mind. He will offend your mind. Because we're so locked with our mind. It's with our spirit. We're so locked. It's got to make sense. I have to understand it. And to me, it's the big three. Acts chapter 1 and 2 starts with the big three things. If you're going to make progress in advancing the kingdom and move into and keep moving into what God has for you and his things, you've got to deal with my will. You've got to deal with foolishness, the wisdom of that doesn't make sense to me. You've got to deal with the mocking of people, people who just don't agree. And the mocking and the sneering, you what? But this one is from within. Your own, yet you're dealing with. The first two is in your own. I do believe they come out of pride. And um, so here it is. Here's his response. He's talking about two rivers that were in Damascus. Are not the Abana and the Farfar, far, the rivers of Damascus, aren't they better than all of the waters in Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. It was like, this is crazy. To bathe here? God will offend the mind. He will. He'll offend the mind to reveal the heart. So I've listed these creation spoken into being. Boy, that stumbles. Lots of people stumble over that one. Creation. He spoke it into being. The Bible. You believe the Bible has come from God, the Word of God? You have to arise above that. It's inerrant. It was just written by a bunch of people. How could that be the speaking of God? They could have made a mistake. There's lots of errors in the Bible. It's not true. There's lots of errors. That's the thought. Or the birth of Christ, the Savior of humanity, God in the flesh, and how he was born. How God chose to have him come into being. It's all part of his magnificent plan. The message of the cross, we've read some scripture on that. Naaman healed of leprosy, we've read that. Jonah and the whale. You don't believe in Jonah and the whale. You know, if you start talking about the Bible, you don't believe in Jonah and the whale. Yeah, I do. John the Baptist. Everything about John the Baptist. It's just everything. Foolishness. So, I'm going to go quickly through. I'm going to the slide where I start listing what to do. At the top of the slide is what to do. Excellent. So, here's the first thing take your stand. Verse 14, the scripture says that on the day of Pentecost, They'd been in the upper room. They were down in the streets. Then it says, Peter standing with the others. They took your stand. You have to take a stand. You have to take your stand. You've got to do it individually. Someone else can't take it for you. But if you're willing to do it, then you benefit from that. You've got to take a stand. On the day of Pentecost, it says, Peter standing with the others. You've got to take a stand. And you'll deal with the foolishness issue all of your life. Tongues, which is a really big one, you've got to take a stand. You don't, you don't go to a church where they think where tongues is a part. Yeah, yeah, I do. And I try and pray in tongues daily. Take a stand. Number two is speak clear and direct, verse 14. It was real clear. Take a stand and don't. Don't marble around. Faye um, saw an advertisement on her phone, and uh, you could buy a month's supply for free. All you had to do was pay five bucks and something, 
this week, five bucks. Actually, she, she did this back in February, five bucks shipping and handling, and you get a month's free trial of this stuff. Um, I, I don't know whether they gave all the fine print or what have you, but the fine print was if you say yes, you, you accept the terms and conditions, you just signed up, and for 160 bucks a month, you're going to get two bottles of this wonderful stuff that ha haven't ever come. And so uh, she doesn't, she didn't know uh, the, what was coming through. And so late this week, I, I was going through our account and I saw, what's this? Honey, did you order this? No, I didn't order that. I paid 575 for uh, shipping and handling for a one-month free surprise. Well, it looked to me like you're signed up. That's $89. That's not, that was half. That was one of the two. And I said, well, I'm going to go to the bank. You've got to be clear. You have to seize the moment. This is going to be foolish. You have to seize the moment. So I go to the bank and go to the one, a, a young gal, and she's very gentle. Sometimes you have people that are very, they're not gentle. You, you, you know when they're gentle and when they're not. She was very gentle, and I, I just explained. And I told her what a, a baby I was. I said, now, listen, I said, I don't, I'm just not interested in hassle. If the, if the bank can recover these, I explained this to you. If the bank can recover these, that's fine. If you want me to call and talk to the guy, I said, if you give me my option, look, I do a lot of the financial business and dealing with the insurance companies for my mother-in-law, and uh, that's a hassle every time. And if you haven't had that fun, I don't wish it on you. Um, and I said, I'm just looking for the easiest way out of this. I don't care if it takes a week or two longer. She said, well, if you have time, I'll call them. I mean, big, strong man of God. I'm going to let her make the phone call for me. This happened this past week, a few days ago, on Friday, actually. And so she calls. I thought she was having a good phone call because she, she said in the phone call, I've enjoyed talking to you. And I thought, oh, good, this has been pleasant. And she hung up and turned to me and said, that was the rudest call I think I've ever had. I can't believe how rude that guy was. And, and she said, this goes on all the time. It's a method of fraud. And, um, and I, she took it. What I've learned to do is she took it. And so I just stretched forth my hand to her. I said, can I have your hand? And she gave me her hand. And sometimes people can give you their hand warm. And sometimes they can give you your, their hand cold. She gave me her hand cold, which was uncharacteristic because she was kind of a warm person. I mean, cold is rigid and tight. It's cold. And I took her hand, and I just prayed for she and her. I looked. She had a wedding ring on, so I assumed she had a husband. And I just prayed for she and her husband that they would have someone who would help them when they ran into a need, just as she had been helping me. I know she was a bank employee. I understand all that. And, uh, God, that you would help them. And when I was finished, uh, her hand stayed cold the whole time period. So I thought while I was praying, this is not going over very good. Um, and when it was finished, uh, I looked in her eyes and let go of her hand and said, I'm, I didn't mean to offend you. She said, no, that made my day. And I realized people want to be prayed for. They want to be prayed for. you got to take your stand all along the way. Is that important to you? Sowing and reaping. That's, I live by that. It's real important. You've got to take a stand. You've got to say it clearly. Number three, proclaim the scriptures. Peter gave, he gave. There's lots of scripture in Peter's message. It starts with Joel, but it's filled with scripture. Give the scripture that you're standing on. Why you do it. It's a good question because that's what you're trusting in. You're trusting in what God has said in his word. What do you do? You, let your, you tell your testimony. Peter, as a part of that message, explained, we were witnesses of all these things. He gave the scriptural account of what Jesus would do. We're witnesses of all these things. He gave his own testimony in that. I've seen these things. I've witnessed because he was talking about the resurrection. I witnessed the resurrection. You just tell your testimony. That's all you can do. And trust it to God. You tell a true, honest testimony. Um, and number five, stay in relationship with like-minded people. Verse 42 and following. They stayed in relationship. They entered into it. They stayed in relationship with like-minded people. 
foolishness. You, all of us, will deal. Each event, each turn, each new season, you go, this seems foolish. I don't know. I don't know. Um, we reached one year of presence and fragrance. I showed you that last week. So in my continuing look at that, March the 4th, we saw, we discovered uh, through someone here that, uh, that the USS Hornet, the CV-8, the carrier vessel CV-8, it was found in berth 8, it, and it sailed on the 88th day. I am one who studies numbers, dates, how long. I've just learned to do that. One of the things that you should do was the next thing found in Acts chapter 2. What meaneth this when something happened? What does this mean? So as a pastor leader, I'm just telling you the things that I've found in terms of the season where we are right now. A year of fragrance in the room, presence in the room. It was fascinating that March 4th last year, 2014, when it began, that on that day, the USS Hornet, back in 1942, sailed for its mission, and its first mission ended up being the Doolittle Raid. And the Doolittle Raid is what God has used to speak to me about the forerunner calling that's on me, and that one clearly lined up the dots on top of each other, and it was a new beginning doubled, 88. It's a new beginning doubled. It was the day, March the 4th, was the 88th day since Pearl Harbor. God speaks out of pictures, analogies. The Bible's full of it. We say Joseph was a type of Christ. How many hundreds of years was he before Jesus? Abraham was a type of faith. All through the Old Testament, the sacrifices, these are an example. These are a type. The tabernacle, the temples, these were a type. These were an example. The Bible's full of types and examples. Do we think he wouldn't do that in our own lives? He does. God doesn't change. Look, in, look at him in your own life. Well, in addition, there was another layer that was added, March the 4th, of this year of 2015 was Purim. I really couldn't have even told you what Purim was. Someone said, oh, that's the Esther feast. Oh, yeah, but I, it's been so long since I had read, not now, I've read it in at least three translations this week. Read Purim, the book of Esther, and Purim actually means chosen by lot. And I found out this this week, so I'm saying this to try and emphasize to you where we are is not foolishness. It's incredibly significant. It's not, do I smell it, do I not smell it? I've never smelled it. It is not foolishness. The Doolittle March 4th link, I briefly spoke of that last week and this week. Kim Thurman was the one who God awakened her very early in the morning, last week, two weeks ago. It was Thursday night, Friday morning. I went and inquired of her, Kim, when was it that God actually spoke to you? Was it Thursday night or was it early in the morning on Friday? She said it was between 2 and 3 in the morning. That made it on Friday. I count. God counts. I count. I have calendars. I've got lists of counts, calendars in my um, Excel, my spreadsheet programs, so I can count how many days and count them accurately and be real sure. And so I, since I heard about that, this is the way it works in me. The question arose, God, why did you wait until this time? Why did you wait till the last week? In my mind, it was the last week. Why did you wait till the last week to let us know about the correlation between the Doolittle and the March the 4th and link those together? And in uh, the Esther story, the year of fragrances and the preparation for meeting the king. Why did you... Uh, that it's, I'm curious about those things. It's the glory of God to conceal a matter. It's the honor of kings to search them out. We have been made kings and priests through Jesus Christ, his blood. His bloodline is a kingly, priestly line. We have in him been made kings and priests. All of you are kings. You may or may not regard yourself in that light, but God does in Christ. And it's the glory of kings. It's the honor of a king to search out a matter. So I love searching it out. I wanted to know exactly when did it take place. Try and stick with me. She said, well, it was 2 or 3 in the morning on Friday morning. 
So I counted, looked at my account. That was 360 days Thursday of that week. It was the 361st day, and I realized from study of lots of times, a prophetic year. There's prophetic years in the Bible. They're 360 days. For instance, probably the most familiar is when Daniel prophesied the Antichrist would exist for three and a half years. He would have his supreme power three and a half years. The book of Revelation talks about the same thing. The, three, the 42 months, the three and a half years, and gives the number of days. It's 1,260 days. And that's 42 months of 30 days each. The prophetic year, it's found other places in the Bible. There's a hint of it in the first chapter of the book of Esther, the prophetic year. That was stunning to me. So it was after the prophetic year, by revealing it on that time, then that opens, at least to me, among all the things that that first 360 days was in the prophetic calendar, it's a prophetic statement. It says to me, it's still on. We made it. It's still ongoing. God waited until there was a completion. There is a timing. All of this as timing. Then I realized, okay, God is fairly complicated. He uses the prophetic calendar, plus he uses the Gregorian calendar, because we went from March 4th to March 3rd in our counting, and March 4th of this year happens to be Purim, and so he adds the Hebrew calendar. He works in the Hebrew calendar, the Gregorian calendar, the prophetic calendar, and he does all three of them. Now, a fascinating research problem would be, how often did that occur like this, that those could line up like that? My guess is it takes a long time. They're lining up. I want to say it's still on. And there is a time, and I believe God waited to reveal it, to let us know there are calendars, multiple systems that God is taking into account all the time. Well, that's way too complicated. Good. I hope God is more complicated than you. It's still on. Maybe this is, because we know about it, maybe this is the year the one year of preparation. Maybe it's finished. Maybe we did it. And now we are waiting for the time. Each of those women in the story of Esther, they prepared for a year. There were many of them. Then they had to wait their turn. I probably have recommended two or three movies in the 30-some years I've pastored. And I'm going to recommend one to you, One Night with the King. It's on YouTube, full-length version of it. Uh, I, without reservation, I recommend that you watch that video. It is not sensual. It is not sexual. It is very biblical. It is not pure biblical. They try and fill in the pieces of events that are missing. It's incredibly well done. It is very God honoring. It is God. Timing is in God's hand. One night with the king. It is not a cleavage show. It is not a sexual show. It is not filled with bad language. There's not one curse word in it. You can almost find nothing. One Night with the King has some of the most fabulous scenes based on the book of Esther, which I believe God's brought to us. Maybe the third movie in 30-some years I've recommend. I recommend you see it. One Night with the King. Chosen, we have been chosen. Purim, the Hebrew calendar. The April 28th date was a crossover. The Feast of Tabernacles was a crossover using the Gregorian calendar. When God let us know 360 days had passed, that is a very significant counting number in Scripture. It's a prophetic calendar. So I say these things to you.
because I'm trying to encourage you to stay the course. I'm trying to encourage you, invest in the match. I'm trying to encourage you, take advantage of the classes. I'm trying to encourage you, be a part of all hands on deck. Comes to Wednesday night meals. Come to the soaking on Wednesday night. Come to prayer Sunday morning. Come to prayer Sunday evening. Come to prayer Tuesday morning. 5 o'clock to 6, 6 to 7, 8 to 9. Come to prayer 11 to 1 on Tuesday. Come to prayer 1 to 3.30 on Tuesday. Come to praying for the lost on Wednesday at 4.30, 4.15 to 5.15. Seize the moment. You will have to deal with your will. It's not what I want to do right now. You'll have to deal with that. You'll have to deal with, wow, this is the answer. This is help. Tongues. And every other manifestation and calling. You will have to deal with that every time to advance the kingdom. God will offend the heart, the mind. He'll offend your mind, your thinking, the way you think it ought to be done to give you an opportunity to reveal the heart, deal with pride, say your will, your kingdom come, your will be done. I am very encouraged where we are. I believe we are right on schedule. Does that mean I like everything I see myself doing? No. No, I don't like everything I see myself doing. Do I like everything I see everybody else doing? No. I don't like everything I see everybody else doing. That's not the point. Do I see a lot of people who are really out there swinging at the pitches, trying their best to honor God? I see a lot of that. I am so pleased with that. I think God is pleased. We've been chosen. We're not better. If God is saying the book of Esther has a lot to say to you, she was willing to risk everything it was based on authority it was in the 12th year of the king there's lots in there about 12s lots in there about 7s there's lots of numbers that correlate with new covenant she was willing to she invested everything to seize the moment that she had It's, but this is not the way I would have done it. I know, I know. I, I know. Timing. I'm so encouraged because timing. It's possible, just as possible as the year of fragrant preparation has begun. It's also very possible. It's happened. It's been completed. We're just waiting for our turn, for the presence of the king. The interpretation can be erroneous. The numbers are real. How they're interpreted, probably there are many different interpretations in the room. but I'm wanting to tell you how I'm leading you. And this thing of foolishness, I thought it was incredible. So when they had this dancing, did you just say, oh, good? I thought, oh, my. Here we go. Um, I'm not sure I exactly feel like dancing today, and I've got a tie on, and it stretches my neck when I, I, I don't know. But boy, that was an impressive list of scripture that she read. That was impressive. How could I not? With a list like that, God loves dancing. Come on, Russ, get with it. So I called for one of our dancers. Uh, Would you help? But I had to constantly tell her, Emily, please slow down. You know, (laughs) please slow. Do I think that could have been a setup by God? Probably. It probably was. And I want to ask, how did you do? 
you could have participated in it like me and despised it all the way and ah, you missed the moment. I hope you bought the moment. I think it was a classic example, unplanned, unrealized, for what I believe the message is for today. You have got to rise above what seems like foolishness. You've got to rise above that. If you'll bow your heads. Father, thank you for the day, this day, a banner day. This day. We have today. We've had this morning. We've had today. I really want to do what you want me to do. I want to do it well. And I want it to be what you really are doing. That's what I want. I pray that for everybody in this room. We would be a people who really seek to honor you. I bless them. I ask that you would reveal Christ to everyone in this room who is not born of the Spirit. I ask that sitting here today, that will come to them. Suddenly, I ask that the cross, the message of the cross, makes sense. And Lord, I resist the God of this world that's blinding the minds of those who don't believe, keeping the light of the glorious gospel. I blind you, Satan, in Jesus' name, and I resist your endeavors to blind the minds of those that don't believe yet. Not in this place. Not in this room. In Jesus' name, you're resisted. Father, thank you for everybody sitting in this room. And I bless them in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen.